There is no such thing as histamine intolerance. For the love of God, probiotics are not the first step to repairing a leaky gut. Oh, <laughs> so Jesus. when you hear that, please don't do that. Antihistamines are one of the reasons why you have histamine overload. Excuse me, we're having to supplement the bloody soil in order to give the, our food system the nutrients it requires. So don't tell me you don't need supplements. How the hell do you not struggle with histamine overload? T. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have a rant for you today. I've I've got a rant about this today. Mm -hmm. We need to discuss why people have histamine intolerance. My God, if you are on the Facebook pages for the histamine groups, it's just constant about the low histamine diet. And I think that this topic is just not being spoken about is the why. Is why do we have this condition? And people are asking. And everyone's like, yeah, it's the food. Food's the problem. And they're just talking about that. And then they're giving these solutions of like supplements and that's it. And it's driving me nuts. I can hear that. I get that. It's, it's actually driving me crazy. And so today, for everyone who's joined us today, thank you so much, firstly. And thank you. And if you are going kind to of enjoying the Can I Be Candid podcast, you need to hit that like button for us because that likes helps us grow and helps us share more of our incredible, hilarious, and let's be honest, me carrying the humorous chats. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> With your hilarious jokes. Well, she's You're jokes. so funny. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and so but I think today is a really important discussion. I think we need to be discussing why we have histamine tolerance. And we're going to throw in some really terrible jokes. But let's start with one point. There's multiple reasons why people have histamine intolerance. But let's start with the big elephant in the room. There is no such thing as histamine intolerance. Yeah. Every single video I'm ever going to do after this point, when we talk about histamine, I'm going to say that. And if it offends people, if it pisses you off, if it challenges your views, I don't care. Because that's the truth. And the truth is what should prosper from the back of this. But yeah, no, you're like, you're so right. I think if anything, the question should be, why don't you have histamine intolerance? Because that's just how prevalent it is today. I think there's a lot of people that are, you know, are struggling with histamine intolerance and they know that they're struggling with histamine intolerance. And by intolerance, I mean overload, because I just realized that I said that. Um, I think if anything, what we really should be wondering is, how the hell do you not struggle with histamine overload? Because so many people are struggling with histamine overload. And, you know, there's a portion of people that are struggling with histamine overload. They know they're struggling with histamine overload and they're trying to figure out how to resolve that or support it. But I actually think that there's a lot of people struggling with histamine overload or even histamine excess to an extent and may not even realize that they're struggling with that. Um, so I think that's another kind of cohort to consider as well. I mean, the best place to start with this conversation from mm. what you just said is let's do muscle activation syndrome versus yeah. histamine overload. So MCAS is something that I'm seeing a lot like people are going, I must have MCAS or I've been diagnosed with MCAS. Right. Mass activation syndrome can only happen for two reasons. Mass activation syndrome kicks off if you have too many mast cells in the body. So your body's overproducing too many mast cells, which is produced by the system, by the immune system. And the other ones is your mast cells are too sensitive. That's the definition of MCAS. Now, look at both those definitions. What's the one thing key that they both have? an immune system, an overreactive immune system, the immune system being triggered, you look at the term histamine intolerance. Now, the reason why I said about histamine intolerance is, how can you be intolerant to something your body naturally produces? We're focusing on histamine as the culprit when actually histamine is the solution. The connection between histamine and mast cells is the fact that it's the immune dysregulation, it's the immune system being overreactive, but we're not talking about what we can do to balance the immune system, we're focusing on the culprits of food. And like the jackassery that's happening right now is hilarious because like you've got people like commenting on this group saying, oh, can someone please give me a low histamine diet protocol? Can someone give me low histamine diet recipes? Like, all right, 
cool. Ask people. I haven't got a problem with that. And my problem isn't that, isn't the fact they're asking for, for support. That's fine. You know, find the information. But if you read the actual clinical trial research papers, because there are literal meta-analysis on this, all the papers say the same thing. There is not one golden list because what you react to, someone else may not react to because you. it's not just about the histamine in the food. It could be the fact that that food, the way it's produced in that specific country might have a toxin in there or it might have a different structure that your body doesn't agree with it's not the fact that f it's the it's not the bloody food it's your immune system it's your immune system overreacting to it it's your immune system saying hey i don't agree with this so let me produce histamine cause you these symptoms and then you then suddenly go oh it must be the histamine and well, it must be the food. It must, well, sorry, yeah. it must be the food. Yeah. And in, and this is the issue. And like, then, you know, that mast cell activation versus histamine, they're coinciding and coexisting as one because your immune system is becoming more and more and more re reactive. And a lot of like the functional medicine, like, you know, era of people are now saying more people are having underlying mast cell activation syndrome that I can get on board with. Mm. Because if you're if you're born with it from a young age, like if there's something going on at a young age where your immune system is overreactive, that I can get on board with. But if you're being diagnosed it when you're in your thirties or forties, bro, chill. That's not that's not that you need to calm you need to calm yourself down there because you're trying to get a diagnosis for an overactive immune system. And like I know people may think that I'm getting a bit ranty right now, but you've got to appreciate is the fact that being in this environment there is so much information and so many people are reading into this but the information we're reading is very heavily biased because it's based on what we knew in 2004 because you got to remember histamine wasn't talked about it was known it was known as a function in the 1970s but it wasn't talked about so this is the main main issue with it now is that you need to be looking at the immune system one thousand percent and i think what you mentioned about the diagnostics and with kind of mcas and histamine overload or histamine intolerance as it's often um referred to it's kind of one of those things that it is and it isn't and not to kind of go off on a, a, in another direction but it's one of my issues with um over diagnosing that the overdiagnosis that we're seeing in t this day and age, like everyone is searching for a diagnosis. And I feel like because of that, we're, um, in my experience, a lot of practitioners or physicians are very generous with immediate diagnosis or like putting a name to things. And so I think we have this situation where, you know, there's people that ha are being diagnosed with an underlying immune issue or MCAS or whatever from a young age or they have a genetic susceptibility and sensitivity and then there's you know people that maybe don't have those things but are living in this environment where they're exposed to a myriad of different things that are breaking down their system and causing this histamine overload and this histamine excess this excess of histamine to be released in response to all of those things that are causing a high amount of inflammation in their body. And because the best language we have today for that is maybe the diagnosis of MCAS, I think sometimes there can be um, that blurred line yeah. between those two things. So I think, you know, it isn't that, you know, you're silly for... Um, having this diagnosis or getting this diagnosis or that you do or you don't, I think, yes, it's getting to the crux of, okay, there's definitely something going on here with uh, histamine if these are your symptoms. But I worry that by calling it MCAS or by kind of holding true to that diagnosis that you can in some ways psychologically fall victim to this idea that, oh, well, I have this, so I'm never going to be okay. Whereas actually, if you keep the focus on the I mean I don't want to say the histamine but if you keep the focus on that there's something dysregulating something you're, triggering something triggering your body is releasing histamine because it's trying to tell you something is not right like 
the histamine release, particularly excess histamine release, that's your body's way of telling you something's not right. I may not show you exactly what's not right, but I am telling you something's not right. It feels like there's an invader in my body or it feels like something's breaking down. Help me. So I think we need to keep the focus on the help me and then go from there instead of thinking, oh, I have this diagnosis. I need to go on a low histamine diet. Da, 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 da. That's who I am now. That's my life. We need to keep the focus in the right place if we want to feel better. Mm. I mean, it's what you said there. We need to keep the focus on what's causing that excessive production of histamine. Mm. And once again, it's the immune system, the mm -hmm. immune dysregulation. I'm going to say something that's controversial. And you know what? I'm going to be candid right now and say this because... No, I, th I mean, that's so weird. You never say anything that's controversial. Uh, do you know what? Actually, it's not even Could controversial. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even controversial. It's just candid. This yeah. you know, is a candid chat, right? But uh, antihistamines are one of the reasons why you have histamine overload. Listen... I'm not anti antihistamine, okay? I'm not anti them because I see they're a benefit. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've used them. I've been privy to using them and they did well, they didn't really support me much, but mm. I but spent most of the nineties on them. Yeah. <laughs> but most people who were taking antihistamines are not understanding the link that an antihistamine blocks a histamine receptor. It doesn't regulate the immune system. So the minute the antihistamine wears off, that histamine is attaching to that receptor and your symptoms are coming back with a vengeance. And do you know why they come back with a vengeance, T? Because you, you've you not got rid of the trigger. You've not got rid of the overactive immune system. So the minute the antihistamine wears off, you're then causing that barrage of symptoms. The other issue is antihistamines are designed for a specific histamine receptor. So you have four histamine receptors in the system, the H1, H2, H3, H4. And if you watch... You know, if you follow our channel and you're on here, we talk a lot about the histamine receptors. So depending on which antihistamine you're taking, let's say you're taking sertraline hydrochloride or lorotidine or, or um, uh, formotidine. Is it formotidine? Yeah, formotidine. Formotidine. Yeah. So right, that's right. the other histamine 1 receptor antagonists. You're turning off the histamine 1 receptor, but you've got those other three to go. So you you stop taking that and you stop taking that you start taking that antihistamine. Histamine still bucket still filling up. It then triggers the H two, and then you go to your GP and say it's not working. They'll go, oh, okay, we'll put you on this antihistamine, or and jeez, yeah. or the level of like, oh my god, I can't even deal with this right because it's it's so it it's infuriating because I feel for the person, but then the person the the doctor will go, well, what we'll do is we'll increase your dosage. We'll increase your dosage again. We've seen people who have been on like four antihistamines a day. An antihistamine has a half-life of anything between six to eight hours. And in some cases up to 24 hours, they should last a whole day. So you're telling me that if I'm taking four a day, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're sticking a plaster on that histamine receptor, but you're not getting to the root cause or the solution of it. I was literally just going to say the same thing in terms of this, again, is one of the issues with our approach to well-being and health in general, but particularly histamine overload or histamine intolerance or MCAS or whatever we want to say, is that there is absolutely utility to antihistamines in some situation. Um, when you're in a bad situation and you just need to bulldoze in there and block those receptors... That's a fantastic utility of antihistamines. Mm. So we're not saying that there's never a case to use them. But in chronic cases, I really don't believe that antihistamines are the answer. And in fact, it's not even a belief. We know that they're not the answer because, as you said, you have to think about it as it's a plaster. Sometimes we need plasters. When we cut ourselves and, you know, where the wound is trying to heal, we need a plaster pr to protect that. But it, a plaster isn't a long-term solution. And so what we're not talking about is, yes, we're blocking those histamine receptors, but what's that doing? Mm. What's that doing to how the body functions? You can't just keep, you know, blocking all of the holes in the body and... <laughs> That sounds terrible. <laughs> that is not a good analogy. But you can't just like plug all of the holes. That sounds bad too. I'm thinking of like a sink and a drain, but yeah. I feel like I'm just going off. But like you can't just keep blocking all of your receptors and hope that your body will 
keep functioning properly because the mast cells and histamine has so many functions in the body. It's not just, you know, giving you hay fever or not giving you hay fever, giving you urticaria or not giving you urticaria. It's a system as part of a bigger function. And also, if all we're doing is focusing on plugging your mast cells, we're not actually focusing on what about all the excess histamine that's already in your system from that histamine overload? What's happening with that? And don't come at me with, oh, well, there's the DAO enzyme because that ain't handling a deep histamine excess. <laughs> well, you just said it there. Like, you know, when you're, you know, one of the reasons why you could have histamine intolerance, I'm going to use that word now because it's like the, it's I feel the like, word. I feel like we have to say, even though, you know, you know, I know, hopefully lots of people watching know that it's histamine overload, it's histamine excess. Obviously to get this information to the right people, you want to use that same language as well. So yeah. it's like a careful balance. So, and that's the, that's the issue. But anyway, let's, <laughs> if you look at it, when you do a genetic test, it mm. tells you if you've got a genetic STIP, which is the MTHFR gene, which we do what we talk about significantly in it. Now, I've sat down with um, Life Code GX, really big fan of Emma and Chloe. And they said that, you know, these guys have thousands of people coming in testing, right? And they were like, 90% of the people don't have the MTHFR gene mutation. They don't have that issue. It's not, it's not a problem. So now, if, you're, if they're seeing that and people are seeing it, what's the, what's the cause then? Because if it's not the MTHFR gene, then it's going to be the fact, and it's going to be the fact that you've got an overactive immune system. If you're producing enough diamine oxidase, then it's, and it's overtaxed and it's overworked, there's a problem. And it's not just histamine, but you've got other things like putrescine and cadaveri, the other amines that we need to be addressing and talking about. And so we're in this kind of like cycle constant cycle of just like it must be my genetics it must be this i need to take this antihistamine to plaster over it and then all we're on this like low histamine diet flex and saying oh i need to go on this low histamine diet i'm gonna make a and i'm gonna i'm gonna prove my point with a statement from a clinical trial paper i'm gonna put the clinical trial paper in the description i'm gonna get my phone quickly for this because it's so funny right so this is a very recent study right this isn't like a an old study or anything this is from 2021. So within that, like, you know, the famous, if the study is not done within the three years, that it has to be, it's not an accurate thing. Five years, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they say if it's not in five years, it, it's not relevant. Don't know why they're doing this now. But anyway, that's another rant for another time. <laughs> it's because we have so much money to be updating all of our research every single year. So this paper is called Low Histamine Diet. Is exclusion of foods justified by their histamine content? And I found this study quite funny because someone actually sent it across to me mm. and one of the main statements is a low histamine diet is currently the most advised strategy to prevent the symptomology of histamine intolerance so even the scientific community are now saying that the low histamine diet is for symptomology so and i like i said before and i said it with confidence before we're not going after the low histamine diet but you give me someone and, I, and this is a call out to every single person who works in this area. You give me a client or a patient, how we want to call them, who's fixed themselves from the low histamine diet and they've managed to return to a normal diet and I'll, I'll, I'll eat my own hat. Oh, 1,000%. I would love to. Because I ain't met one. To, yeah, yeah. I, ain't met, I ain't met one. But also, and like this is, because I have beef with the low histamine diet and the reason being is that if that's your approach to quote unquote, fixing histamine overload, then you don't fully understand how histamine works in the body. Because if you're, I mean, technically speaking, you could probably have a decent balance if you really, really worked hard with the low histamine. That's assuming that you're, uh, you're tolerant to all of the foods that are categorized under low histamine, which isn't usually the reality in my experience with um, speaking to people that are actually on these diets, looking at case studies, looking at the research, as we said, because it's more of an immune regulation issue and there can be, you know, gut breakdown, permeability, all of these other things going on. Mm. Usually people are actually far more restricted than we're led to believe. Yeah. But 
The problem with that is that you're forgetting that in order for the body's natural uh, histamine regulation cycle to work, you need nutrients, particularly micronutrients. You need <laughs> like you need a a good quantity of things like iron and B12 and B6 and zinc and vitamin C and all of these things that you're not getting from a restrictive diet. So tell me how that makes sense. Because yes, you might actually reduce your histamine load initially and get that initial feeling of, oh, this is working. And then, and this is the story we often hear, you get that initial feeling of, oh, this is working. And then a few months down the line they're like this isn't working so I need to restrict more oh this still isn't working let me eliminate more and you find yourself in this place that it can be tricky to get out of because you're stuck in this cycle of now all you have is 10 12 15 foods that you can eat your body's totally malnourished and I don't necessarily just mean with macronutrients because I think we just way too heavily focus on macronutrients because you can look fine maybe your complexion is a little off but it's the micronutrient deficiencies the suboptimal levels so that the actual body isn't able to work all of the pathways that are required to cleanse your body of histamine naturally to support DAO production to support the immune system are totally depleted so your body's just falling apart and it's making the issue worse because your immune system is becoming more dysregulated your gut health is becoming even worse your permeability is becoming higher all of these different things and so you're caught in this cycle and if we're only focusing on low histamine diet as a solution then your focus is in the wrong place and you're not going to heal Mm. i mean that is an, an important factor within itself like you said there the micronutrients if we look at now one of the big conversations is regenerative farming Mm. because the fact that soils are so depleted we're now having to grow certain plants with other plants to add like nitrogen into the soil like to regrow those plants literally having to supplement the soil you know it's so funny to me that people talk about like oh you can get everything from a balanced diet you don't need to supplement it's like excuse me we're having to supplement the bloody soil in order to give the, our food system the nutrients it requires. So don't tell me you don't need supplements. Yeah, that like I said that one of the biggest growing p- problems for the planet could be food shortages by the fact that we don't have enough of the raw material to not even feed the animals, but to feed the human being. Well, we already have a nutrition, a nutritious food shortage, mm. you know? I mean, we fortify everything now. We have to fortify foods because of the fact that we've got that nutrient deficiency. Oh, so yeah. a lot of these like studies on like how much min- milligrams of like magnesium are in broccoli, you probably have to eat like 80 broccoli to like to even get to that point. You're going to trigger me, Dilly. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> and that's if you can even access the magnesium because of all of the bloody chemicals and pollutants that are sprayed onto our vegetables that Which, are like affecting mm. our body's ability to break it down. <laughs> Plus the histamine intolerance we have that's causing inflammation so our actual digestive system isn't functioning the way it is like don't get me started yeah. but but the thing is like allopathic medicine and the people that are talking about the low histamine diet they they're we're, we're told to tell this as a solution right because it gives us an instant relief but mm-hmm. it's like you just said you're missing out on the micronutrients that your body needs listen you will make your histamine intolerance worse because what you're going to do is you're going to remove beneficial nutrients from your system you're going to feel exhausted you're not going to poop properly because honestly if you're not shitting properly that's a major issue you're going to get constipated because you're not getting enough of the right soluble and soluble fibers and then on top of that you're going to start adding to your immune dysregulation because your body needs those nutrients to survive if if you didn't eat for two weeks what would happen your body's gonna your body's gonna mess up if you're not drinking water tea the amount of people that like don't drink enough water you know there's a study that's done on lack of like people being hydrated triggering their histamine and like triggering their immune system because their body's not getting enough of it but there's the thing is that there's also there's yes people not drinking enough water but there's also a lot of people that are drinking enough water but they're not getting enough salts in order to allow them to absorb that water because we're being told that we need to have low salt diets all the time 
um, which is just nonsense. It's like this cycle that we get caught into. And it's not often the person that's the issue. There's so many people out there that are trying really, really hard, but they're just getting bad information or we're being pointed in the wrong direction. And we just feel like we're failing and we're, you know, trying to keep our head above water. But what I wanted to ask you with regards to the histamine overload, histamine intolerance and that immune link is, in your opinion, why do you think that our immune systems are being triggered more and more today. Can you speak on a little bit of like what is it that's triggering this increase in histamine intolerance or histamine overload? What's mm. stimulating this overreactive immune system in so many people? Because it can't be a coincidence. I mean, what's not? The question is what's not? Like, okay, <laughs> if you're stressed out, you're going to trigger your histamine overload. Why? Mm. Because stress puts places it literally triggers a histamine response because yeah. your your body releases histamine which triggers cortisol which puts your body in fight and flight because if you're stressed out your body assumes right you need to be in this stress response because you're handling the situation and what will happen as your cortisol increases and, and peaks you'll hit a wall so you know when people are really stressed out they become really exhausted it's because your body's produced so much cortisol so much that histamine your body's like exhausted and it, you need to physically just rest and sleep but you can't because of the cortisol spike yeah and also that increase that rise in cortisol and that histamine release that is depleting your nutrients do you know how many nutrients it takes Magnesium, to release cortisol vitamin d b2 one that people don't think about vitamin c Comes your adrenals. Genetic snips. Yeah, yeah yeah anyway yeah but that's <laughs> no but t like you do you need to talk about more of this because yeah. that's so so important because the genetic SNP testing will identify if you've got a, the B2 deficiency which so yeah. many people is it the B12 or B2 I think it is it's B12 a of, is more of yeah. the, the genetic link with the MTHFR and that whole cycle um, but B2 is something that we don't really talk about it. I don't know it's not one of the like sexy B vitamins that a lot of people talk about but it's really important for uh, your adrenal function which by the way um, produces not only your stress hormone, but also your reproductive hormone. So it's definitely something that you want to be aware of. Um, but I digress. The other things. I mean, st you st mean? stress one of them. Yeah. Pollu I'm you mentioned kind of pollution and, um, you know, well, on our I, crops and things like let's that. Go, let's go into mold and mycotoxins. Mold and mycotoxins are, have a major, have, are becoming a major issue now, right? And people are now talking about mold and mycotoxins being a problem. Listen. Mold and mycotoxins have been around for years. It's only become, it's only triggering you now because your immune system's overreactive. Look at crop production, look at bread. You've all, everyone's watched, well, I don't know if everyone likes him, but Jeremy Clarkson's farm. He did a bit, right? And you can watch one of the episodes where he's talking about how much mold is in the physical wheat on, and the rapeseed. And that's another topic of conversation and like the seed oils. But basically, they, Talk about how much mold is actually in the physical food that's allowed and all those different sources of mold are, are hitting the system and people are like, you can leave a moldy environment? Yo, chill. You can't leave a moldy mold environment. We live in the UK. Go to the US. It's a problem everywhere. But you can do things to decrease the mold of mycotoxins, but still, the issue is the immune system. So you've got mold of mycotoxins, you made, just Sorry, before go you on. go on, you made such a good point there in terms of, I, I do sometimes think that there's a little bit of a belief of like, oh, where are all these problems coming from? Like, why is mold all of a sudden an issue or why are, um, you know, toxins or chemicals in our beauty and household products all of an issue? Why is perfume giving me headaches all of an issue or hormonal imbalance? Um, why am I sensitive to gluten all of a sudden or sensitive to wheat all of a sudden? I like I think sometimes the that's the reason that these things get brushed off as like, oh, there's no way that we could just be all of a sudden getting uh, sensitive to all of these different things that have existed forever. And you hit the nail on the head there in that actually we are because these things aren't new. They've always been around. You can't, you can't live in the world today and escape mold. 
But what's happening is that our immune systems are breaking down because we're exposed to so much more of these things. The quantity, because the regulation around these things is honestly shocking and it's anger inducing. So don't get me started on that. But the regulation has been so poor on bringing these different things into our environment that now we're in a situation where so many of us are exposed to such a high quantity and such a large variety of different chemicals, toxins, molds, preservatives, additives, food colorings, sugar, all of these different things. And it's assaulting our immune system. So they're slowly breaking down. And so more people than ever before are reacting to things that maybe our, you know, our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents never did have an issue with because their immune system was more intact. They weren't exposed to as many things so they could deal with the little bits that they had in their environment. Yeah, 100%. Sorry. <laughs> I no. felt like I needed to release that. I was like, you know, this. you made such a good point. Like, this is why people think sometimes that it's just nonsense because they're like, how could that all of a sudden happen? If my grandparent or my parent was exposed to this as well, then, you know, it should be fine. But it's not fine. Well, we did the topic on gender bias in trees. And like if you if you literally watch this video, I explain how as we've industrialized and as we become into like, especially in the UK, as we become a service country where we literally take services rather than actually manufacturing. And as the population growth has happened, we've planted more male trees which produce mm. pollen rather than the female trees because they produce pods which create mess. And that's another video that you can just literally watch straight after this. But all of this is like bombarding the system. And so stop trying to prescribe me an antihistamine. Stop trying to give me a low histamine diet. Stop trying to give me a, this like so-called what they think is a long-term fix. And start talking about what we need to do to balance the immune system. So I think, we, you know, this is a really couple of conversation. I think it's going to be a conversation we're going to have over a couple of videos and what I would say is what we need to conclude on is what you can do to balance your immune system because I think this should be the point that we get to because if you watch this video to its entirety and thank you for staying intact and listening to our little yeah. rants because we really <laughs> appreciate it but let's talk about the basic things vitamin D Massive. vitamin C magnesium zinc selenium potassium sodium all these basic electrolytes that our body should be consuming every single day that we can try and get from food. But if you're on a low human diet, hey, you can get it, bro. You're going to get it. But these are basic minerals our body needs. And the second thing, detox histamine. Bring the histamine levels down and repair a leaky gut. Mm. The root cause of a dysregulated immune system for me personally and from all the my 10 years of doing this is always going to be a leaky gut. Mm. It's an immune dysregulation. And for the love of God, probiotics are not the first step to repairing a leaky gut. Oh, <laughs> so Jesus. when you hear that, please don't do that. But also on the kind of how to the foundational pieces of regulating an imbalanced immune system. I also think we need to talk about what we need to remove because just as much as introducing all of those minerals and vitamins and re-nourishing the system is so important, removing the things that are causing so much inflammation and toxicity are equally important. And I don't just mean, you know, trying to reduce your exposure to chemicals and toxins and pollutants through the food that you eat or the products that you use, but also the people that you hang around with, like reducing the daily situations that put you in a sense of stress or anxiety or, you know, cause you to feel low or sad because that's actually just as important. Mm. Um, and that's coming from a nutritionist, like, you know, talking about nutrients and understanding that association with the body is my thing. But actually, if you're in an environment where you're constantly feeling anxious or stressed or overwhelmed, that's going to impact your body in the same way. So I, I really think that when we're having the conversation about, OK, what, you know, tangible things can I do in terms of like, what can I take? What can I eat? We also need to be talking about, well, what can I 
um, remove? How can I relax? How can I rest? Um, how can I restore? Mm -hmm. And for some people, a certain amount of exercise obviously will be important. But also if you're really, really in a, a stressed and anxious and drained and exhausted, overwhelmed space, then, you know, things that feel like... Um, a lot to try and do probably aren't the first step in terms of like that intense exercise or intensely changing your diet. Sometimes the first step can be taking a step back. Yeah, I'm hundred percent. I mean, that's, these are all little things that you can actually physically do. And like, okay, stress and is a tough one because yeah. you've got work from stress and you're in a you're in a position like that. But sometimes you know people are we have those people that are just stressed before stress being stress sake. I would say people, but just to kind of circle back to the mineral side of it you know like having basic electrolytes in your diet like just literally supplementing with electrolytes will help just adding a little bit of electrolytes into the system just adding that into a little bit of water and drinking it will support your system and if you can't afford electrolytes don't worry about that salt yeah just literally get Use good salt. yeah get good salt pinch it into a little cup of hot water Add a cool, cool, cool water and just drink it. Mm. There's Celtic sea salt. We'll link the ones that we personally use in the description. And these are basic minerals you can add to the system that support the body. First thing in the morning, glass of water, sprinkle of salt. It'll do you so much good. People, I've been saying this for so many years. And I honestly think people have thought I've been crazy because no, yeah. like still... I think less so now, but particularly like 10 years ago, people were like, low salt, low salt, remove salt, take it off the table so it's not tempting you. You don't need salt for flavor. You can just use herbs. Salt makes a difference. Add mm. some salt in. You, particularly if you're like fatigued or super stressed or anything like that, your adrenals need salt, your but your immune system needs salt. Your whole body needs these minerals. But good quality salt. If it's just like regular plain crap salt that's mostly sodium, yep. then that's not what you need. Because when we say salt, we mean salt that has a balance of salts. So potassium, magnesium, sodium, all of these different things. And ideally some trace minerals as well. Whereas a lot of salt that we get today is mostly sodium. So just keep that in mind. Mm. T's hit the nail on the head there. I mean, this these are all solutions. Obviously, we haven't gone into like the how much you need per day, but these are basic things that you can do. Consider. And if you do want to have a bit more information, just put it in the comments and we can see how we can, you know, give you some advice on if there's a supplement that we recommend or a product that we think you should go for, mm. we'll put them all in the description. But I think there is obviously more to what causes histamine going to say the word intolerance again but what causes it because obviously there's things like medications and stuff but i think like i said this isn't just one video i think this is one of many videos to come out because there's so many things that are triggering it but i'm going to say it i'm going to say it again this can be reversed this can be repaired histamine is boring and i'm i say that with a fact histamine is boring because we can fix it that's not the problem it's the other things that are the problem. Yeah. But thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. This has been such a fun topic of conversation. It's got my juices flowing, put it that way. And I think there's going to be, I think people, some people really will resonate with this. And if you do resonate with it, please just let us know in the comments. And we really do appreciate like a lot of feedback. And if there's anything you want us to cover, let us know in the comments. Yeah, I hope so. I, you know, I think these kind of conversations are really important. And I think the main thing is that, you know, illness and feeling unwell or you know having histamine overload or excess that doesn't need to be your journey that doesn't need to be your story um we can figure this out and and we can feel well again mm. so thank you <laughs>